Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Dana Andrews and Ida Lupino in Daisy Kenyon. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Like many of you, I was among the three quarters of a million readers who made Daisy Kenyon one of the best-selling novels of its year. And we're fortunate that picture-making is drawing more and more on bestsellers for its stories and its characters. We can also thank 20th Century Fox for their excellent screenplay of Daisy Kenyon, which we bring you tonight, starring that very fine dramatic actress, Ida Lupino, and Dana Andrews, playing the screen role to which he brought such rare distinction. I suppose it's only appropriate that one bestseller should be brought to you by another bestseller. The latter, of course, Lux Toilet Soap, which I'm sure is your favorite beauty aid as well as the favorite beauty soap of screen stars. And it's equally appropriate that a story of romance, as is our play tonight, should be brought to you by a product that has meant romance to many, many women by helping them have that lovelier Lux complexion. It's curtain time, and here's act one of Daisy Kenyon, starring Dana Andrews as Dan O'Mara and Ida Lupino in the title role. <laughs> York City. It's late afternoon, and in her apartment, Daisy Kenyon, young, attractive, and quite a successful magazine illustrator, has just received a visitor. Dan, I told you I had a date for dinner. It'll keep. Who with, baby? Well, I met him at a party last night, and I have to get dressed. I'll only stop by for a minute, Pat. I, I can't make it to Latimer's tomorrow night. Oh, Dan, do you realize this is the third time in a row we've broken a date with them? Change it to next week. I'll be there if it kills me. No, I won't. We just won't plan anything at all. I'm going to Washington tomorrow. Washington? How thrilling. Harry S. wants your advice on atomic energy. Now, look, Daisy, your being mad is silly and you know it. I've never broken a date with you unless I couldn't help it. Unless it was something really important. Oh, thanks. Oh, I don't mean that you're not important. But we can go to the Latimer's next week and we can see each other almost any time. No, Dan. I don't think we can. I think we're through. Do we have to go through all this again? We don't have to go through anything again. I just have to fight to stay happy, that's all. Fight for everything. Oh, my life's all mixed up with you every way I turn. I've tried and you've tried, but it won't work out. You have a wife, two children, big law practice. You're going to be important in Washington. I only have my work. You've messed that up, too. Don't be mad, honey. Dan, I am mad, and when I am, I can't even paint. You're never going to marry me because you'll never divorce Lucille. That's not fair, Daisy. Dan, you're never going to be divorced because you don't want to be. Look, I, I'm not being sorry for myself. I knew it would be like this. It, it's just that I'm tired, that's all. Tired and through. I'll get out whenever you tell me to. But I want you to tell me because you mean it. Not because you're angry. Are you really telling me now, Daisy? I said I was. Oh, Dan, will you ever believe I really mean what I say? I've tried to break this off. Honestly, I've tried. And I will one day, too. All right. You will. Maybe next year... Maybe next week, but not this week. No, not this week. Now go on, beat it. <laughs> I date you. Bye, darling. Hey, taxi, taxi. Sorry, I'm keeping this cab. Why well, tie it up? After all, Miss Kenyon may not be ready for another thirty minutes. Miss Kenyon. You've got a date with her, haven't you? Yes, I have. I say, look, I'll send the cab right back. As soon as I'm through with it. Thanks. It's very generous. Sorry to have kept you waiting, Pete. That's all right. Well, shall we go? Oh, finish your drink if you'd like. Well, thanks. Uh, how about the Brevoort for dinner? Haven't been there since before the war. Well, I'd love it. The war's been over for some time now. Not for me. I re-enlisted. Just got out again last week. Oh, glad you did. Oh, it didn't matter one way or the other until last night. What happened last night? I met you. 
Why did you keep asking me if I were real? Why not? Nothing else is real anymore. Mary tells me you're a boat designer. Hmm? Yeah, I used to be. Oh, yes, I remember now. You designed the Lapham Six Meter. And there were wonderful photographs of boats in the magazines by a Susie Lapham. My wife. Oh. Tell me something. Don't any of you ever go back to the wives you left when you went to war? Uh, excuse me, Pete. Yes? Your cab, lady. That party said to come back here. Be down in a minute. Seems there's a cab waiting. Oh, you must have sent it back after all. He? That fellow who was leaving just as I got here said he needed a cab. Oh, yes. Yes, he can be very rude at times. He was, I suppose. Oh, I didn't notice. We were talking about your wife. You were. Yes, she... Uh, she's dead. <laughs> phone, Dan. He said he'd come by with the Fosters. Oh, that's fine, Lucille. Yeah. It won't take me a minute to change. You look very nice. Well, thank you. Dan, why are you going to Washington tomorrow? You know, Father never discusses business with me. I'm going down to present a brief to the SEC on amalgamated gas. I so seldom know what you're doing. No one even expects me to know anymore. <laughs> Do you think I know what I'm doing, honey bunch? Where are the kids? Oh, Rosamond's primping. Oh, really, Dan, I wish you'd consulted me before you told her she could go with us tonight. Thirteen's no age for the store club. What's the harm in it? Where's Marie? I'd better look in on her. She's supposed to be doing her homework. She's getting awfully impudent, too. I don't know whether... <laughs> Marie, go to your room. And I meant what I said. Go to your room this instant. Daddy, Daddy. Lucille, what is this? Marie's been insolent. I told her to stay in her room because I... Oh, Daddy, Daddy. Well, what is it, baby? She hit me. She hit me. But she said things. I've never been spoken to like that in my life. And by my own child. It couldn't be that bad, Lucille. <laughs> oh, look, sweetie. Mommy didn't mean to hurt you, and I don't think you meant to be rude to her. That's one of the very worst things you can do, being rude to your mother. Dan, you don't... You remember the fourth commandment, don't you, Marie? The fourth. It's even ahead of murder and stealing. Now, what was it you wanted, anyway? I, I just wanted to come down when the company came. Well, maybe you can. Lucille, I'm sure she'll do her best to get her homework finished. That has nothing to do with the way she spoke to me. Marie, now say you're sorry, then go wash your face. I'm sorry, Mother. Thank you, Daddy. Don't ever hit that child again, Lucille. How can you have so little control as to let an 11-year-old child... Control. Get... You see the children five minutes a day just enough to spoil them. But if you could understand how thankless it is for... Marie me... wants to see the company. You want to be here a few minutes? Is that going to hurt her? How do you know what hurts her? What hurts anybody? Oh, I realize what I am to you, only don't interfere when I try to make better human beings of my daughters. Lucille, please. No, but once I'm going to say it, I know exactly what I am to you. Sometimes I wish I didn't know. Know what? You just lost your temper with Marie, now you're losing it with me. Maybe I haven't been the best husband, but if you want me to stay any kind of husband at all, you'll never say anything, anything again like what you tried to say just now. You say you know exactly what you are to me? Well, if you do, then you know the good things as well as the bad. You'll never have any unless, unless you ask for it. And you know it isn't thankless. We have two fine girls, and you're to be thanked for that. Now, how do you nose? Go on, honey. And cheer up. Fine time, Daisy. I even like the nightclubs. Hey, do I talk too much? Oh, you may drink too much, but you don't talk too much. Ah, I feel good. Why'd you want to leave the stock club? Oh, didn't you think it was a little crowded? I didn't notice a soul except you. Hey, uh, why are we stopping? No particular reason, except this is where I live. Oh. <laughs> do you know it's half past three? No. Uh, Daisy, Daisy, tell me something. Hmm? Now that I've forsaken the army, what am I going to do for a living, huh? Well, there are a lot of beautiful sloops waiting to be designed, I understand. No, kid stuff. I think I'm going to be a ruthless tycoon from now on. Fine. Will that give you time to see me again? Sure. Sure, I'll see you. I mean it. I'm not just being polite. Well, don't say it if you don't mean it, Daisy. Call me Sunday. If you're sober by Sunday afternoon, you can take me to a baseball game, Well, I love you. You what? Good night, Miss Kenyon. Good night, Mr. Lapham. So I 
took a chance on finding you home and put in the call. How's New York, Daisy? New York's fine, Dan. How's Washington? It's terrible. Say, what are you doing home on Sunday afternoon? And how's your boyfriend? Boyfriend? The one you went out with the other night. <laughs> I stole his taxi, but I sent it back. Did you get it all right? Oh, yes. It was very funny, wasn't it? I was furious, and I still am. Then bumping into us at the stork club. I didn't bump into you. All right, you didn't. Really, Dan, you behaved like, like a... Like a cat, huh? <laughs> well, are you going to leave me for him? I'm going to leave you all right. But not for Mr. Lapham. He's nice, but a little unstable. Oh, really? He's got an interesting face. Daisy, listen, I expect to leave here this afternoon. I ought to be in New York about 7. Want to meet me at Penn Station? No, Dan. You can meet me at the Savarin restaurant. No, I... I don't think so. Oh, come on, Kev. Don't make me beat you down every time. All right. I'll see you at the Savarin. Thanks, Daisy. Well, hello, Counselor. Hello, baby. Thanks for coming. Oh, it was fun sitting here alone. You should try it sometime. I'm sorry, Daisy. I'm scared stiff you might not have waited. You see, I, I need your advice. Hey, waiter, two martinis. You need what? I've just taken a case that's going to make you feel you've had a very salutary effect on me. Why don't you just buy me a newspaper? If you took a case like that, it must be on page one. You're very ungracious. I took it because it's going to make you proud of me. Do you want my advice, or do you just want to brag? Hmm? A little of both. I want to know how I'm going to break this to my wife's old man, my law partner, you know. Oh, yes. He's going to have a stroke when he finds out we've taken a case with no fee, no publicity, and representing a Japanese. Incidentally, I'll have to go to California. It's the case of a veteran, Suyo Noguchi. He fought in Italy. Comes home with a purple heart, silver star. Only there isn't any home to come to. Some smart operator out on the coast digs up a law written by Cortez... Moves his farm right out from under him. Well, think I'm wonderful? I am proud of you, Dan. Well, why don't you kiss me? I will. Now, where shall we have dinner? Oh, we won't, honey. I've got to see my father-in-law about this and a couple of other things. Which reminds me, there's some more advice I want from you. This is seriously, Marie worries me. Lucille doesn't seem to know how to handle a child. What would you think of a boarding school for a while? Oh, Dan... How do you expect me to answer a question like that? By the way, the other night in the stork club, Rosamond bowled me over. You didn't tell me she was getting so tall. I thought Lucille looked very well. Yeah, you sound jealous. Didn't it ever occur to you that I have more reason to be jealous than Lucille has? Here we are having a perfect time when you... What are you fumbling for in your purse? A nickel. Have you got one? Sure, yeah. Thank you. Excuse me, I'll be back in a minute. Daisy, there's you open the phone booth. Who are you talking to? Neither am I, Mary. So I thought if you could meet me at my apartment, we'll have a Daisy. bite and go to the movies. D D Daisy, listen, I don't have to leave for half an hour. What did you say, Mary? Now, please don't get mad again. Daisy, can't we be happy for just one minute? Just a second, Mary. Dan. Dan, I've had a bad day. I've been walking around all afternoon. Three blocks north, three blocks south, south by north. I can't wander all my life. I've got to be going somewhere. Can't you understand that? Even if it's only to the movies. Hello, Mary. I'm sorry. I'll see you in 15 minutes. Yes? Me, Pete. Pete Lapham. Oh. Well, come in. I, I know it's awful late. I'm waiting in the drugstore across the street. I was going to a ball game this afternoon. But instead, I went to a movie tonight. Well, I, I tried to phone you. I've done something bad, huh? Yes, Pete, I guess you have. You better tell me. Well, you were supposed to call me this morning and take me out this afternoon. That's all. Except I didn't. Except you didn't. I forgot. All right. Look, it's late. You better run along. Well, can I come back again sometime? Uh, no, I, I don't know, Pete. You... You mix everything up. You don't sound mixed up, Daisy. You sound composed and certain. No, don't, Pete. I I'm going. I just want to hold you for a minute. The world's dead. Everybody in it's dead but you. Daisy, did you ever let yourself get into a mood you couldn't find a way out of? What's the matter, Pete? My wife was killed five years ago. Automobile accident. That started it, a kind of slow dying. 
I fought against it, but it happened anyway. The war did the rest. Oh, that's foolish, and I think you know it. Yeah. The two times I was wounded, I, I wanted like anything to live. When I got well, it started again. Susie gone, I didn't want to see any of my friends or go back to anything I'd ever done before. Oh, come on. I don't believe a word of it. Oh, I believe the facts are all right, but not the melodrama. If everything had gone dead for you, Peach, you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't be here trying to sound like a case history. You know all about case histories, don't you? All right. Have your tragedy. Go on. You're sort of using me, aren't you? Yes. Aren't you using me? We can talk about me, but not about you. There's no drama in my life. You're in love with a ruthless tycoon. Isn't that dramatic? It isn't like that at all. Do you love him? I suppose I do. But it isn't enough. I wouldn't be here, would I? Now, Pete, in all the case histories I've read about, it seems a good idea to get a job. Find other things to think about. Oh, Daisy, the whole thing would disappear a month after we were married. Married? Oh, you're a South by North character, if ever there was one. You're exactly what I don't need. You know you're very tender about being proposed to. Oh, no, Pete, please. Why shouldn't I ask you to marry me? I love you. I want to marry you. Oh, please say yes. Please come and, and meet my sister and brother-in-law in Scarsdale. And, and receive a letter from my aunt in Cambridge. Please, Daisy. Come live with me. Be my love. Oh, or better still, let me come here and live with you. Please marry me. Darling Daisy. Lovely Daisy. You, you have such nice ears, Daisy. Look, I... Listen, let's, let's start all over again, hmm? There's a ball game Wednesday night. Okay. I'm not here Wednesday at 7. I won't bother to call again. Good night, Miss Kate. Dad, when did you get back from California? Ten minutes ago, Papa. Why? Now, see here, Dad. I'm not only your father-in-law. I'm also your law partner. Have you any idea what's been going on here since you've been away? How about that Chelsea number, Marsha? I'm still busy, Mr. O'Malley. Amalgamated gas is retaining Stevens because we don't give them enough time. The SEC has postponed the hearing and the Buckley case... Can I go away for 18 days without you working yourself into a state? How Lucille and the kids? They're fine. We're all having dinner tonight. And if you want a pleasant dinner, let's get our harsh words over with now. Oh, do we have to have harsh words, Sugar Plum? Uh, it was tough enough before you took on that ridiculous Noguchi case. When you shut yourself up for 18 days in Papa, California... did you or I ever object when Coverly Sr. spent four months a year on his yacht? What's that got to do with it? We didn't object, did we? A man needs his relaxation. And I never object when you stand up in a trout stream looking like Calvin Coolidge two months a year either, do I? What's all this got to do with a grandstand play defending a Japanese? If it gives me pleasure to fight some race prejudices, including your own, that's my sport. Understand? All right, Dad. Who brought the SEC case in here anyway? Amalgamated gas, National Motors. And why do we still have to have your papa's name on that door ten years after he drowned himself in a boat race? I said all right, Dad. Okay, Judo. Now that the harsh words are over, phone Lucille for me, will you? Ask her if she'll meet us at the colony at nine. Very well, Dad. Tell her I'm back and happy and well and that I love her. And that you're happy and well and that you love me. What about that number, Marsha? Still busy, Mr. O'Mara. Oh, forget it. I'm going downtown. I'll be back by six. No, my line wasn't busy, Dan. I, I had the receiver off. Well, didn't you get my wire? You knew I was coming back today. Yes, I knew. Speaking of wires, I sent two or three myself. That didn't make sense. You're going to marry him? Is that it? Is that what those telegrams mean? I have married him, Dan. I wanted to tell you to your face. I couldn't do it over the phone. Oh. Say, these photographs. <laughs> That's a twist. They're his. Pete. That's what I mean. The guy moves in and brings his edgings with him. What's his connection with boats? He designs them. At least he did before the war, upon Cape Cod. We're moving there as soon as we can. Oh, well. Yes, I can get my magazine assignments here and do my work up there. After a few months, people know what he wants to do. He, well, he doesn't think he wants to go back to boat designing. This photograph. This boat's the Sartatia, isn't it? Yes, his father designed her. It was a wonderful sloop. I used to sail her years ago with old Pop Coverley. I didn't know you cared anything about boats. A lot of things about me you didn't know. A lot I didn't know either. Well, have a good life, baby. 
You deserve it. Bye, Daisy. Goodbye, Ben. Hello, Mr. O'Mara. You want this taxi, too? You hadn't planned to keep it? No. Oh, this is where I'm living. Yeah, I just heard about it. Your father designed the sortation, I understand. Well, yes. There was something about her I was never able to figure out. She was the only boat that didn't roll to the swells. Didn't do what? Didn't roll to swells. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the blue nose in her, the old cluster hulls. Ever see her out of the water? No. She's almost straight walled for three feet below the water line. What I don't understand is who figured out that a few planks in the hull of a ship could make her behave in a planned way. Who? Observing seamen. Logic. It's things like that that make people like me mad. Why? Anything logical makes me want to fight for some reason. I've always distrusted logic. That's what makes life unexpectedly pleasant. The illogical. Like this moment, for instance. Why doesn't one of us take a poke at the other and get it over with? <laughs> Someday one of us may. Meanwhile... Good luck, Mr. Lapham. Thanks, Mr. O'Mara. You know, the, uh, the cab. I won't send it back this time. In a moment, we'll bring you Act Two of Daisy Kenyon. Meanwhile, here's our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins. What's the good word, Libby? Well, Mr. Keeley, after hearing our guest reporter, Sheila Graham, last week, praising Frank Capra's State of the Union, I made a point of seeing it. And I'm sure you found the picture a delightful experience, as I did. It certainly was. Naturally, a combination of stars like Spencer Tracy, Catherine Hepburn, and Van Johnson should make any picture an outstanding success. Especially a romantic and amusing comedy like that one. As Sheila said, it's so timely for Metro Golden Mayor to release it now. Its political situations provide some of the best laughs of the year. What did you think of Angela Lansbury's performance as the lovely and ambitious publisher? One of the high spots of the picture, Mr. Keeley. She made the most of her opportunity to play with three such top stars as Spencer Tracy, Catherine Hepburn, and Van Johnson. And Angela comes off with flying colors. <laughs> I knew you'd like her. Besides proving herself a fine actress in State of the Union, she's a really beautiful girl. I'm sure John Kennedy noticed that lovely complexion of hers. That's what most of us notice first of all, Libby. Angela, like so many Hollywood stars, is a Lux girl. Indeed she is, John. She told me so herself. Lux toilet soap gives her skin just the gentle, protecting care it needs. It's a soap made to care for million-dollar complexions. Nine out of ten screen stars recommend daily beauty facials with Lux Toilet Soap. Yes, that rich, fragrant lather does wonderful things for the skin. Leaves it softer, smoother, screen stars say. Tests prove this beauty care really works. Skin specialists found that in actually three out of four cases, complexions became lovelier in a short time with gentle Lux Soap care. I'm sure any woman who tries it will understand why Lux Toilet Soap is Hollywood's favorite beauty soap. Why not get some Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow? See what fresh new loveliness it gives your skin. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. We continue with the second act of Daisy Kenyon, starring Ida Lupino in the title role and Dana Andrews as Dan. It's three months now since Daisy Kenyon and Peter Lapham were married. Three months since Ida has seen or heard from Dan O'Mara. Daisy and Pete are now in Cape Cod, driving toward the cottage they've just purchased. Pete, who is that man? The one you spoke to in Provincetown. Well, that was Dino, darling. Dino's a fisherman. I haven't seen him in years. He wants me to rebuild his boat for him. Going to? I don't know. Maybe... Dino says there's lots of work for me around here. Mm -hmm. I think I'd like to meet Dino. Oh, when I told him my wife was here, he thought I meant Susie. Oh? He knew her? Yeah. We, uh, we had a cottage a couple of miles from where we'll be. Uh, I didn't tell you You because... didn't have to tell me, Pete. She isn't out of your life yet, is she? Of course she is. No, it's not that easy, Pete. Don't ever expect one person to replace another one. You sure you're talking about me, Daisy? Not entirely, no. 
You lost something in Susie, and I lost something in Dan. There's no right to expect the same things in each other. And it's no good thinking about what we've lost. It's a lot more fun to find out what we've gained. Oh, I love you, Daisy. Thank you, Pete. Now, suppose you keep your eye on the road. That's our new house we're going to. No, no. Pete, oh. Pete, wake up, oh. darling. What is it? What's the matter? Oh, Daisy. Daisy. Pete, are you all right? Nightmare. I fell asleep in the chair, I guess. Well, see who you married now? Son of Dracula. I was about to fix dinner. You called out. I can't even keep my nightmares to myself. Sorry. What was it, Pete? How do I know? Susie, the war... No Welsh rap. Most of all, Susie. You say so, Doctor. I say so. Because I've had to work hard to get Dan out of my system. Pete, I, I was cleaning off the desk before, and I found this. When did you write this to Susie? The night she died. I'd forgotten about it. You go through my papers often, sweetheart? Well, it was in the common property draw. Almost as if you wanted me to find it. The winds of earth are old and sane. But tell me, tell me when you know what happens to a hurricane that hasn't any place to go. I wrote that in self-pity. The whole nightmare was that. You know, you, you never told me that you loved me. Pete. No, no, don't say it now. I, I like you for not saying it. Let it grow. Let it grow until loving me means loving the earth. All that's sweet, green, and mellow, and exciting. On the face of the earth, the face of the ocean. Let it grow, Daisy. Well, this is a fine time to get home. Since when do they launch boats in the dark, huh? <laughs> Sorry, Daisy. Dino had a little wine. I've got some good news. Another job. It seems the fishermen are all getting jealous of Dino's new boat. Oh, darling. I have good news, too. The Thursday Review called. Want me to do a serial. Hey, that's really big time, huh? Pete, I... I'll have to go to New York tomorrow. Oh, I wish I could go with you. You can't? No, I promised Dino I'd finish rigging tomorrow. Oh, well, that's all right. I... I why Mary. She took over my apartment. She'll have to share it with me for a few Oh, who's this letter from, Daisy? Oh, that came from Dan. Seems he's back in California. Mary sent it from New York. It's not a letter, just a clipping. Look. Eastern attorney defending Jap attacked in courtroom fracas. <laughs> it's a very becoming bandage he's wearing. Yes, I say poor Dan, only I'm sure he loves it. Well, if I'm going to New York tomorrow, I've got a lot of things to do. <laughs> Dan. Hello, baby. You alone? Yes. Well, can I come in? Dan, no. I... This isn't my apartment anymore. It's Mary's and... Daisy, she... I need to talk to you. Then take me to lunch tomorrow. I need to talk to you now. Dan, I don't want to see you now. Look, I just got off the plane. You're the only person in the world I want to see. I haven't any right to need anything from me. I haven't anything to give you. Daisy, I'm tired. I've just had some trouble. Well, not family, personal that way. Just something I cared a lot about that blew up. You remember the Noguchi case? Yes, I remember. We got beaten. Noguchi lost his property. You've lost cases before, Dan? I don't feel I ever had a case before. I'm still surprised I can't get used to it. Why is it so bad? I don't know. Maybe it's because I got mixed, mixed up in my mind with you. The two lickings together. Dan, I... I don't like seeing you this way. I thought we were good friends. I've thought of you many times, but when you come in like this, I... I'm glad you thought of me when you were happy without me. Have you been happy, baby? Yes, terribly happy. Happier than I ever made you? That's a very stupid question. You never used to be stupid. You sound clinical. This is something new. Well, I thought it was about time. I began to run my life with some intelligence. Maybe that's what sounds new. I think it's a pose, and I wish you'd cut it out. Sound like Daisy Kenyon. Well, that's more like you. Start slapping, baby. That does me good. Shall I tell you what's been going on between you and Pete? 
convinced yourselves that you love each other. <laughs> that was easy. Both nice peaceful people, so logically, why shouldn't you love each other? You know just about everything, don't you? Sure. Well, what good does it do me? I can't even win a simple case. Dan, most people take a beating every day. Who told you you were special? One time in your life you thought about somebody else you lost. Well, that's too bad. If you're really trying to do something that will change things for people, you've got to be humble. Don't tell me to be humble. I'm so far down right now. That's not being humble, Dan. That's being sorry for yourself. I liked you better before. You had friendship in you then that met mine at the door. In all the world, there was only one girl. Dan, let me go. Why should I? Let me go, Dan. Why can't you understand that I need... Let go of me, Dan. Let go of me. I'll never forgive you. Never. Daisy, please. Well, did I come home too soon or not soon enough? Oh, Mary. Hello, honey bunch. <laughs> Daisy, please let me talk to you. Please. Get out. All right, we'll get out. Father. Oh, thank heaven. I came over as soon as I could, Lucille. Now, what's all this about Dan? When did he get home? About an hour ago. He looks terrible. He's ill, Father. He must be. Did you call a doctor? He wouldn't let me. He saw the children for a few minutes, and then he said he wanted to be alone. I'm sure he's just upset about that case. He's not used to losing, Lucy. No, no, it's something more than that. Oh, maybe I'm being crazy, but please stay here tonight. He's never been this way before. He locked himself in his study and... Well, there's a revolver in there. No, really, my dear. Uh, tell him I'm here. Maybe he'll see me. Oh, I'll try. He won't, but I'll try. Daisy, listen to me. Please don't hang up. <gasps> I don't know how all that happened, but it, it wasn't you. It wasn't me. Lucille, what are you doing? Isn't Dad in the study? He's talking on the phone. There's an extension here, Father. Wouldn't you like to listen in, too? Lucille. Daisy, darling, don't let it end like this. Dan, it ended a long time ago. You make me so ashamed. Daisy, I had to call you. This is the worst night of my life. What am I supposed to do about it? Shall I sit down and write a letter to my husband? Oh, no. No, Mrs. Lapham. Or should I say Daisy? What's that? Don't bother to write your husband. Lucille! It's none of his business, is it? We have a lot in common, your husband and I. Lucille! I'm sure your husband ought to know this thing's going to go on forever that Give I... Give me that phone. I think I'll calm down, don't you, Lucille? You think if you can start me talking, I'll calm down? Well, you're wrong. For a long time, I didn't think you were worth killing, but you are. Daddy! It's... It's all right, Marie. Don't worry, baby. That was just talk. Where are you going? I'm going to see Daisy. She'll let me. <laughs> Hello, Daisy. You've been out walking, too. Don't see how I missed you. I covered both waterfronts. I'm going upstairs, Dan, alone. Daisy, I I think I'm humble now. Oh, I haven't started to straighten out the mess at home yet. I had to look at you first. Oh, Dan. Just to look. I couldn't go on thinking of you with that expression in your eyes. Dan, please. There's nothing now either of us can say or do. Then we won't say or do anything. Just let I'm me going look. in, Dan. And you're not going to stop me. No, Daisy. No. I thought you'd come back, Dan. Well, Lucille thought it would be better if I did the talking for her. She wants a divorce, and I can't talk her out of it. The only question is, what kind? The best that money can buy, of course. Lucille's quite bitter at the moment. She wants to divorce you here in New York and uh, name that girl. And what do you think? I might be able to persuade her to do it the easier way if you cooperate about the children. And just what does that mean? Lucille must have sole and absolute custody. Of course, eventually, you'd be able to see them, but Lucille thinks there should be a clean break now till they're adjusted to it. Uh, perhaps you can understand that. Till she sold them on the idea that I ran out on them, you mean? Oh, come now, Papa, let's talk sense. Dan, there's no other choice. Think it over. Let me know. Well, thanks. I'll phone you. Oh, I'll be in the office. But I won't be at the office. Not long. I'm pulling out of the firm, Sugar Plum. Perhaps you can understand that. But, Dan, there's no reason why a purely personal conflict... Sure there is. Your sensitive nature. Why, you'd wince every time we met. 
Your humor's in rather bad taste. Besides, it'll give you something to occupy your time. Without me around, you'll have to work for your income. Good night, Papa. Marie, you came all the way to the office by yourself? Daddy, oh, Daddy, I had to see you. I took a taxi cab. Rosamond was coming, too. But Millis and Harris asked you to go to the movies. Oh, what's all this about, sweetheart? I'm going to live with you, Daddy. I don't care what Rosamond does, but I'm going to live with you. At the club, baby? Ladies aren't allowed there. Look, I'll move just as soon as I can, then you and Roz can come and live with me whenever you like. That is, whenever it's all right with your mommy. It won't be all right with her, Daddy. It's awful without you. When you're not there, she hates me. No, no, baby. She'd never hate you. You mustn't think because anybody's unhappy that they hate you. We'll talk about it again, sweetheart. Suppose I pick you up at school tomorrow, huh? I want to talk about it now, Daddy. Well, there's somebody here waiting to see me, sweetheart, but tomorrow we'll go someplace and have tea. A regular grown-up day, just the two of us, huh? Now, you better run on home before Mommy starts worrying about you. I'll have Miss Adams go with you. Yes, Daddy. Thanks, baby. But I won't live with her. I just won't. I'm sorry I kept you waiting, Mr. Lapham. Why did you wire me, Mr. O'Malley? Something happened? I wired you because I wanted to tell you I've seen Daisy and nothing's happened. Well, that's clear now. We're meeting Daisy. She doesn't know I sent for you. Okay? I don't know what this is all about, Mr. O'Malley, but fine. Let's go. We thought you'd be surprised to see him, Daisy. Do you two get together often? Not as often as we should. Pete, why did you come down? Because I wired him. I have things to say to both of you, and there's no point in having to say them twice. I think misunderstandings are childish. We are grown-up people. I I... believe we are. Don't you know it? I have a hunch that when people talk about how grown-up they are, it only means they're not very sure of it, Mr. O'Mara. Well, if you let me talk, Mr. Lapham, maybe you won't worry so much about that. Now, let's simplify things at least. He's called Pete, and you're Dan. Anyway, it all started on Wednesday. I just come back from California. I saw your wife, Pete, and I behaved like a heel. Any questions? No questions. Whatever happened, well, it doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter, Pete? Hmm, you're not getting hostile, are you? That wasn't on the agenda that you should get hostile. Honey Bunch, I'm not hostile. Honest. Now, go on. Well, if all this was something that concerned only the three of us, we wouldn't need to say another word. But I'm asking your permission to let me turn our private affairs into newspaper copy. My wife is suing me for divorce. Dan. She wants to bring your name into it. You see, Pete, they figure that in order to keep Daisy's name out of the newspapers, I'll sign away the right to see my children. No, Dan, you mustn't. It'd be terrible for them. Marie especially. So, I'm putting it up to both of you. It's not a thing to be decided without realizing what it involves. Well, if they want to fight, we'll give it to them. I'm sure we can lick it. I'll clear you, baby. Uh, may I speak now, Mr. Chairman? I suppose so. I, uh... I said it doesn't bother me what's happened between you and Daisy. You see, I walked into this marriage with my eyes open. I knew what I was up against. It's a long shot, but I thought it worth the chance. Well, wasn't it? Oh, I can't complain. I pushed my way into your life, Daisy, because I needed you. Well, I'm fine now. Better than either of you. That's all there is to it. That isn't all there is to it. The only reason I was able to break in was that he didn't love you enough then. If I'd met you now for the first time, would I be able to break in? I'll do my own thinking, thank you. My own existing. I'm all for that. That's why I'm leaving it up to you. So that you can work it out without being bothered by... Well, by my being around. I'm sort of a formality we can dispose of any time you give the signal. I want to be married on formalities. How can you say a thing like that? I didn't plan for this, baby. You ought to know that. I'm almost glad it happened. It's nothing like a crisis to show what's really inside of people. You don't mean that. Don't tell me what I mean. Let's go. I don't like it here. Will you like it any better in a courtroom? Yes. Yes, I think I will. <laughs> We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. (laughs) 
In a moment, we'll return with Act Three of Daisy Kenyon. If you could see Miss Lorette Lewis, our guest this evening, I'm sure you'd be as amazed as I was to hear that her theatrical experience began exactly 16 years ago. You were just three, weren't you, Lorette, when you answered your first curtain call? Yes, Mr. Keeley. I appeared in a musical show that starred my mother and father. We made a complete tour of the Orient. And then you came to Hollywood and were signed by 20th Century Fox. Do you like working in pictures as well as you like the stage? I love my work at the studio. There's so much to learn. It's fascinating to watch famous stars before the camera. Mm, you must have many opportunities to do that. I saw them making Sitting Pretty. That's one picture I'll never forget. Imagine the sophisticated Clifton Webb as a babysitter. <laughs> a hilarious situation in itself. Especially when he takes over the household of Maureen O'Hara and Robert Young, the children's parents. Everyone in the studio used to crowd around to watch those scenes being filmed. It was a riot. Maureen O'Hara plays a wife in Sitting Pretty that any husband might be jealous of. Oh, yes. She's very lovely. You saw the picture, Mr. Kennedy? Yes, and uh, I agree with you. Maureen O'Hara looks more charming than ever. I'm sure you know she's a luxe girl. Naturally. Million-dollar complexion like hers must have the right care. I know Maureen O'Hara always uses Lux toilet soap. She says it's a real beauty soap. Gives delicate skin the care it needs. That's the reason nine out of ten screen stars depend on daily Lux soap beauty facials. From my own experience, Mr. Kennedy, I know it's a complexion care that works. Well, Miss Luez, if your audience could see you, they'd understand why we say Lux curls are lovelier. Thank you for being with us tonight. I hope every woman who's looking for a gentle, effective complexion care will take this hint from Hollywood. See what the Screen Stars Beauty Soap will do for your skin. We return you now to William Keeley. Our curtain rises on Act Three of Daisy Kenyon, starring Dana Andrews as Dan and Ida Lupino as Daisy. <laughs> For two days, the divorce trial of O'Mara versus O'Mara has dominated the headlines with a glare of flashlight bulbs directed at Daisy Kenyon. Now in the crowded courtroom, Daisy's friend, Mary, is on the witness stand. Miss Barnes, you said you've seen Mr. O'Mara and Miss Lapham together on several occasions. Before she was married. Uh, before she was married. But you also testified that on the night Mr. O'Mara returned from California, they were again together. Yes, it, it was a great surprise to me. Why? Because you assumed her marriage had ended their friendship? I knew it had. <laughs> you knew it had. Thank you, Miss Barnes. You're a devoted friend. Counsel for the defense. No questions, Your Honor. Very well. We'll recess until one o'clock. Oh, How about a picture, Mr. Kenyon? Just one. one. Just, Just take it. Oh, 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 Lucille. Oh, oh, Lucille, wait a minute, please. Well, Dan. The kids, where did they go? They left with father. Do they have to come to court to hear all this? I'm acting under advice. What about Marie? What's wrong with her? What do you mean? You know what I mean. She looked ill. Well, she, she's she been having a little trouble with one of her ears. Why don't you take her to a doctor? She's been to the doctor. He says it's nothing. Did she have a blow of some kind? No, it's, it's purely a nervous reaction. Don't let me detain you, Dan. Mrs. Lapham seems to be waiting for we can get a sandwich downstairs, Daisy. Oh, let's wait till the courtroom's empty. It's been a little brutal this morning. We're building a case for the newspapers and nothing else. Oh, Daisy. Did you see Marie? Yes, I did, dear. There's something wrong with her ear. I remember now how it must have happened. When Lucille first heard about you, she took it out on that child. I don't think she meant to slap her quite so hard, but... Daisy, forgive me for this. Sure, baby. I forgive you. Now, come on. How about that sandwich? Very well, Mrs. Lapham. Do you deny that before your marriage to Peter Lapham, you were in frequent communication with Mr. O'Mara? No. Now, during this period of uh, friendship with Mr. O'Mara, how often would you go out with other men? Object, Your Honor. Your Honor... I only wish to point out that the events of the past form a very substantial background for what went on the evening that Mr. O'Mara returned to New York. You're not entitled to establish it in cross-examination. Uh, 
Mrs. Lapham, you've testified that your marriage was a happy one. Was that true on the evening in question? Yes. And on the following day? I didn't see my husband the following day. And is it not true that you and your husband have not seen each other since? Now, Jack, I submit this whole line of questioning is irrelevant. May I add something to that, Your Honor? I don't know if this lawyer has the legal right to ask these questions. But whether he has or not, I protest them. I protest them as a human being. That will do, please. The objection's overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, will the witness tell us in her own words just what is the present status of her marriage? Well, it's true I haven't seen my husband for some time. It has nothing to do with Mr. O'Mara's return from California. At least my husband said it, it wasn't important. Your Honor, may I say a word? If it's agreeable with plaintiff's counsel, Mr. O'Mara? Certainly, Your Honor. I request another assess. For what purpose, Mr. O'Mara? For the purpose of a private conference of the plaintiff. Very well. Court's adjourned until 3 o'clock. Why did you do this, Dan? I could have gone on. Maybe you could. I couldn't. There won't be any need to stay here, Daisy. What are you going to do? I'll give you a little hint. It has to do with how much I want you to be happy. Go on home, Daisy. I'll, I'll come by later. <laughs> Well, Dan, you asked for this recess. Well, Bob, I think we all realize there's no sense in prolonging this sideshow. Dan, but Please, I... Lucille. Dan, before there's any talk of a reconciliation... Skip it. Then we'll just have to proceed with the suit. For what? You haven't a prayer on that kind of evidence. Well, I think... Let's not waste time on what you think. As someone who understands a little law. Well, you can go on raising the roof, I'll admit that. But what's the point? I'll agree to your original terms in exchange for a quiet divorce in Nevada. You'll have the girls all to yourself, Lucille. Give them a break. Oh, Dan, it's no good without the two of us. Neither of us alone is enough for them. Dan, I've hurt you, I've hurt the girls, I've hurt her. But nobody as much as myself. I'm sorry, honey. This didn't start out as my idea. You carry on with the details, will you, Papa? <laughs> Very happy to see you, Pete. I've been trying to find you for two days. Been right here in New York, working on plans for a diesel fishing fleet. Oh, that's fine. All I want to know is if you still mean something you said at our last meeting. What did I say? That you'd be willing to bow out of your marriage any time Daisy gave the signal. I haven't seen Daisy. Am I being signaled? I want to marry her. I've taken the liberty of drawing up these papers. Naturally, Where Daisy... Where do I sign? You know... I'm completely baffled by you. Well, I, I don't pretend to be able to explain myself in detail, but just what is it that bothers you? I was pretty sure at one time that you were in love with Daisy. Who said I wasn't? Well, here you are, giving her up without a murmur. The least you could do is give me that punch in the nose I once talked about. These, these papers, did Daisy prefer that I sign first? Well, no, not exactly. The fact is, I haven't asked Daisy yet. But... Well, don't you think we ought to go through the formalities in their proper order? Sure. You think so? Why don't we phone her at Mary's apartment and go and see her? Fine. Why don't we? Yes, Dan, I heard you. Thanks for calling me first. But I couldn't. No, I, I'm not up to that kind of civilized nonsense. Oh, please, Dan, don't bring Pete here and don't come yourself. I, I've just got to be alone for a few days. My work's piled up on me and I... Dan, I just can't talk. No, I can't figure you out. Don't try, Mary. Well, you've been in love with Dan for so long, and now that he's stopped the trial to save you... I, I just don't know what I want, that's all. It's about time I found out, once and for all. I'm going away, Mary, back to the Cape. Now. Hello, sir. I have your party now. Go ahead. Hello. Daisy, this is Dan. Pete's with me. What are you trying to do? Hide from us? Where are you? On the Cape, North Truro. We've got to face this thing out, baby. There's no use running away. Don't you ever believe I mean what I say, Dan. I've got to be alone. Daisy. Hello? Hello? Well, honey bunch. Now what? She's at the cottage, isn't she? She won't be at the cottage when we get there. You're the character from these parts. See if you can hire a car. <laughs> What time?
time is it? How long have we been here? Three hours. It's obvious she left right after we phoned. How far could she get in a blizzard like this? Why don't you ask her? She's at the door now. What? Hello, Pat. Where have you been? It's not very smart driving around these roads on a night like this. Not very smart. I was running away. Thanks for changing your mind, baby. I didn't change my mind. Well, how'd you get back? I didn't hear the car. Had a kind of crack up. Daisy. Are you hurt? No. Car will have to be towed in, I guess. Turned over. Daisy. Oh, really, I'm all right. As a matter of fact, I feel better than I have in weeks. <laughs> Maybe that's a good way to get clear on things. Shock treatment. Oh, but you're sure you're all right. Let's go on with the meeting. We've sent for a cab to take one of us back to the station. It'll be here soon. There isn't going to be any meeting. And you're both going back. And leave you here alone when nothing settles? All right. Who has the floor? Who do you suppose? Not necessarily, honey bunch. In fact, I yield. Well, it doesn't make much difference who says it, Daisy. Dan's asked me to give you a divorce. I didn't tell him to do that. No, it's his own idea. Apparently, he had reason to believe you'd go for it. Why did you come here, Pete? To have you ask me for it yourself. Oh, I see. There's a cab. Yeah, I guess so. I'll wait outside. Daisy, we need a fresh start. We've been through a lot, and we've never given ourselves a fair chance. It took me a long time to realize it, but I know now what I want. I'd give up everything for you, baby. As a matter of fact, I practically have. Marie and Rosamond. That was the only way to end it. Oh, but you shouldn't have, Dan. I could have gone on. I told you that. Nothing was so important that I could let them tear you to pieces like that. Lucille would have called off the whole business and gone back to you. It's too late for that. Can it ever be too late for your children? Don't you understand? It's... It's all over, that marriage. No. No, it can never be too late as long as the children are a part of it. Marriage doesn't break up that easily, Dan. It's even later for us. You said it took you a long time to realize where you stood. Well, me too. But a little while ago, when the car went off the road, things somehow got much clearer. It's a funny thing about being in love. Sometimes it's easier to tell when, when you are than when you aren't. Dan, I stopped being in love with you a long time ago. But, well, the memory kind of lingered on, kept me mixed up. Whatever you call it, love or anything else, it won't be over till we're dead. You've got to kill it, Dan, for good. I'm sorry if I let the memory mix me up. It mixed me up, too, I guess. I was so sure. The things you put up with for my sake. Never would have worked. Really, darling. Because what you wanted wasn't anything more than... Wanting to run away from responsibility. The way you're doing now. Goodbye, Dan. Yes. I guess that's that. Maybe. So long, Daisy. As you was right, Pete. We're both taking the cab. Well, come on, get in. No, Dan. Uh-uh. Hey, what are you doing? Same as you, honey bunch. I'm going home. It's my house there, you know. My wife. Take him to the railroad station, driver. Pete? Yeah. That... That O'Mara put up a great fight. What do you know about fighting? When it comes to modern combat tactics, you're both babies compared to me. Oh, I love you, Pete. Now you know what happened to that hurricane. That didn't have any place to go. Yes, Daisy. Now I know. Pete and Daisy to what should be fair weather sailing from now on and bring our stars back for a curtain call. Dana Andrews and Ida Lupino, who in real life are themselves among our more accomplished sailors in Pacific waters. 
In fact, Dana, you've just returned from your latest cruise, I understand. That's right, Bill. I just got back from a cruise along the coast of Mexico, or what I call our back door, South Seas. Uh, on your own boat, Dana? Yes, I have an 80-foot catch now, able to stand up under any kind of weather. <laughs> Believe me, we've got plenty of all kinds, too. Was this strictly a vacation trip, Dana? No, actually, it was business. Oh, well, we did some fishing, but principally we were taking color movies for a travelogue or featurette. Oh, a picture for general release, Dana? That's right. We shot some 10,000 feet of color film, which is... Of course, we'll have to edit it before we release it. Those little-known waters of Mexico should have a lot of interest for the public. Of course, we feel so. The uh, San Benitas Islands, for instance, where we got some wonderful action shots of those sea elephants, you know, those big 4,000-pound monsters. They, you don't find them in many parts of the world. So this is your first attempt at producing and directing pictures, huh, Dana? You planning any other films? Oh, yeah. I've scheduled a trip to the South Seas in Tahiti for another travelogue. As soon as I finish the picture that I'm making now at Enterprise, no minor vices. In which I understand you're playing the part of a pediatrician. <laughs> Where did you ever get your training as a pediatrician, Dana? <laughs> right at home. After all, I'm bringing up four kids. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're teaching them to use Lux soap. Oh, you're a Lux soap fan too, Ida. Oh, yes, indeed, Bill. I use it faithfully for my complexion. I wouldn't be a day without it. Oh, I understand Lux has a special treat for all of us next Monday night, Bill. Yes, Monday night we bring our audience... An hour of light-hearted and romantic fun with Paramount's sparkling comedy, The Perfect Marriage, starring the delightful team of Ray Milland and Elizabeth Scott. Yes, it's the story of a perfect marriage. Perfect, that is, until our curtain rises Monday night on sudden, boisterous complications. Well, the perfect marriage should be perfect for your listeners, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night, and happy sailing to you both. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ray Milland and Elizabeth Scott in The Perfect Marriage. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to remind you of a very serious appeal. An appeal for your help in fighting cancer, the deadliest enemy that this country knows. The toll of cancer has exceeded the fatalities of all the wars we've ever fought. And that toll is rising, not diminishing. There's only one way we can help combat it. By contributing as much as we can spare to our local offices of the American Cancer Society. Send in your contributions this week. Dana Andrews appeared through the courtesy of Samuel Goldwyn. Ida Lupino appeared by arrangement with 20th Century Fox, producers of Darrell F. Zanuck's Academy Award-winning picture, Gentleman's Agreement. Heard in our cast tonight were Ira Grossell as Pete, Francis Robinson as Lucille, and Bill Johnstone, Jerry Moore, Ann Carter, Herbert Butterfield, Robert Griffin, Irene Winston, Eddie Marr, and Truda Marson. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is rebroadcast to our men and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear The Perfect Marriage with Ray Milland and Elizabeth Scott. Pepsodent won by three to one. Yes, in a recent survey, families throughout America compared new Pepsodent toothpaste with the brands they'd been using at home. By an overwhelming average of three to one, they preferred new Pepsodent with Irium over any other brand they tried. They said new Pepsodent toothpaste tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Yes, with families who made comparison tests, Pepsodent won by three to one. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of The Perfect Marriage with Ray Milland and Elizabeth Scott. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.